Elizabethan drama is actually one of the three major periods in the English Renaissance theater. Jacobean theater follows from 1603 to 1625 and ends with the Caroline theater. Thus, Elizabethan drama is mistakenly used to indicate the 80 years of dramatic flowering. But the height of the English Renaissance theater does occur mostly during the Elizabethan period from 1580 to 1610. This period has long been considered the height of English literature and perhaps even world literature. Europe was finally coming out of the intellectual dark of the Middle Ages from the 5th to the 15th centuries. This is also referred to as the Dark Ages since it sat in between the light of the Greek and Roman thought and the Renaissance that followed. Creativity and a new way of thinking were being developed and embraced by all of Europe in, and in England. With the help of the theater, this intellectual flowering united all classes of society from the rich to the poor into one whole. At the end of the 15th century, Every Man, a morality play, marked the end of medieval drama. The start of modern drama began in the house of the Archbishop of Canterbury, John Morton. He would host Christmas time plays called Revels. They were short, their main purpose was to be viewed as morality plays, and they were religious in nature. It was not until the middle of the 16th century that using the classics in drama began to change the way they were written. Schoolmasters would write classical comedies in English based on the Latin plays for students to read. The classics, along with the Latin tragedies of Seneca, which had five acts with bloody plots, had a profound influence on how drama would be written up until modern times. As in medieval times, these tragedies often served as warnings to those in power that no one was free from fate and that the mighty can be brought low. Drama was no longer to be just a way to teach religion or morality. It was to reinvestigate the classics of Greece and Rome, as well as to entertain. The first English tragedy was written by two lawyers and was performed in a law school in 1561. Its plot is very similar to Shakespeare's King Lear, written about 40 years later. However, in order for drama to mature and grow, a grand audience was required. The only audience that drama had attracted so far was commoners. Most dramas were performed during summer and winter festivals. The troubadours took their shows on the road and performed from portable stages or in the courtyards of inns, but these could not attract large audiences. The actors were rarely respected, and the profession was considered no better than street performers are today. It was not until the plays were taken off the street and performed in the royal court, and performed later by university-trained thespians, that the level and quality of drama started to advance. In order for drama to be respected, the actors needed to be respected as well as their craft. The respect came with repertory companies, continuous groups of actors performing a number of different plays on different days. The actors were all male because females were not permitted to act, and the female roles were usually given to young boy apprentices whose voices were still high pitched. The actors shared the profits of the productions and scripts were supplied by either hack writers, outside writers, or by actor playwrights who wrote plays as well as acted in them, such as Shakespeare. Now all the audience needed was a place to view the drama. Theaters were eventually built out of the growing popularity of drama. The first theaters in England showed a style of the old inn courtyards of the past. Inns were two or three stories high that would have a square courtyard and a stage was usually built under a balcony and then pushed out into the courtyard. However, the need for live animal shows and acrobats made this type of enclosure impossible, so enclosed amphitheaters were built. These led to theaters being built with the same structures as the inn and courtyard. The stage was pushed out of the two or three story building and like classical Greek stages, the audience's seats radiated out from the stage forming a circle.
The first theater in London was called the theater. It was built in 1576, but disassembled in 1599 because most of the civil authorities found the theater to be immoral. It was then relocated across the Thames outside of the city limits and rebuilt into the globe. This is the theater that Shakespeare's company operated out of and it is still famous to this day. With the theaters built, the final ingredient for drama to flourish was the need of master playwrights. The first English tragedy ever produced was called The Spanish Tragedy by Thomas Kidd. It is classical in style and is compared to Shakespeare's Hamlet that would follow a decade later. As a revenge tragedy, it has a ghost of a father demanding revenge from the protagonist. There is a bloody ending with the death of both the protagonist and the murderer. Perhaps Shakespeare took some inspiration for Hamlet from this, for this was still in production when Shakespeare first went to London to act and to apprentice as a playwright. But to say Shakespeare copied Kidd is to misunderstand classical training. None of Shakespeare's plays are originals. They are all retellings of other stories. Students of classics were taught to integrate as much of the classical stories into a current context, since nothing could rival the classical writers. Shakespeare is the most well-known playwright in the world, but was he the first master craftsman of drama? No. This honor goes to Christopher Marlowe. Tamburlaine the Great is his first tragedy. This play is noteworthy because it was the first English drama written in blank verse, becoming very accessible to the general audience. Fresh, vivid language marked a new style for English drama. It was violent and cruel in five acts, which imitated classical Seneca, but it was also wildly popular with the people. It would set an example of how tragedies would be written early in the flowering of English drama. The play tells of the vicious rise to power and the mysterious death of the 14th century Mongol conqueror, Timur, also known as Tamburlaine. Here are three scenes from Marlowe's exceptional tragedy that influenced even Shakespeare. The title page of part one says, Tamburlaine the Great, who from the state of a shepherd in Scythia by his rare and wonderful conquests became a most puissant and mighty monarch. Tamburlaine the Great, part one, the prologue. From jigging veins of rhyming mother wits and such conceits as clownage keeps in pay, will lead you to the stately tent of war, where you shall hear the Scythian Tamburlaine threatening the world with his astounding terms and scourging kingdoms with his conquering sword. View but his picture in this tragic glass and then applaud his fortunes as you please. The title page of part two reads, Tamburlaine the Great, with his impassionate fury for the death of his lady and love, fair Xenocrate, his form of exhortation and discipline to his three sons and the manner of his own death. Tamburlaine the Great, part two, act four, scene one. Well, bark ye dogs, I'll bridle all your tongues and bind them closed with bits of burnished steel down to the channels of your hateful throats. And with the pains my rigor shall inflict, I'll make ye roar that earth may echo forth the far resounding torments ye sustain. And when an herd of lusty Cimbrian bulls run mourning round about the females' miss and stung with fury of their following, fill all the air with troublous bellowing. I will with engines never exercised, conquer, sack, and utterly consume your cities and your golden palaces. And with the flames that beat against the clouds, incense the heavens and make the stars to melt as if they were the tears of Mahomet for hot consumption of his country's pride. Until by vision or by speech I hear immortal Jove say, cease my Tamburlaine. I will persist a terror to the world, making the meteors that like armed men are seen to march upon the towers of heaven, run tilting round about the firmament and break their burning lances in the air for honor of my wondrous victories. Come, bring them to our pavilion. 
Tamburlaine the Great, Part 2, Act 5, Scene 3. This is the last scene. Now, eyes, enjoy your latest benefit, and when my soul hath virtue of your sight, pierce through the coffin and the sheet of gold, and glut your longings with a heaven of joy. So reign, my son, scourge and control those slaves, guiding thy chariot with thy father's hand. As precious is the charge thou undertakest, as that which Clymen's brain sick son did guide, when wandering Phoebe's ivory cheeks were scorched, and all the earth like Etna breathing fire. Be warned by him then, learn with awful eye to sway a throne as dangerous as his. For if thy body thrive not full of thoughts, as pure and fiery as Phyteus's beams, the nature of these proud rebelling jades will take occasion by the slenderest hair, and draw thee piecemeal like Hippolytus through rocks more steep and sharp than Caspian cliffs. The nature of thy chariot will not bear a guide of baser temper than myself. More than heaven's coach, the pride of Phaetian. Farewell, my boys, my dearest friends, farewell. My body feels, my soul doth weep to see. Your sweet desires deprived my company. For Tamburlaine, the scourge of God, must die.